Please welcome to Google New York, Chef Paul Lebron. Thank you. We're so glad you're here. Thank you very much. It's Pleasure. an honor. Pleasure to be here. So we're going to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So when and how did your interest in food start? When and how? Um, I would say in my early teens. Um, I, I, I didn't grow up from a food background at all, so mm -hmm. I had uh, no family in the business, as a lot of chefs do. They, it's something that they're born into. So it, it just happened growing up in the center of London. Um, I grew up at Chinatown, so I guess maybe that had some connection to food there. But um, I would say 12, 13, 14, around that age. And your first job was at New York, New York, and London. Mm. So besides that being a sign of what was to come. <laughs> kind of telling, yeah. Yeah. What was the biggest challenge of your early years? In uh, working at New York, New York? Yeah. Um, well, I was a dishwasher. That's working illegally <laughs> at 14 years old, because yes. you're supposed to be 16. So I, I lied. I'm a tall guy, so they believe me. Um, but um, the challenges, um, it wasn't really a challenge. It was fun. I mean, I was 14 years old, and every you know, it was it was fun. It was just fun. That's interesting. Yeah. My first job was in a kitchen, and it actually was a waitress. I don't remember it being that fun, but I'm glad that you had fun with it. It's probably why you're mm -hmm. an amazing chef. So, you mentioned that you started working in kitchens mm. at 14, mm. and you spent a lot of your teenage years in these restaurant kitchens. Mm -hmm. How did how did that, or some, or what are some of the biggest ways that that shaped who you are today? Well, I think anybody that works in a kitchen, um, in a professional kitchen, will tell you that you know, it really sharpens you up. And especially at an early age, when you're surrounded in a very high pressure, highly detailed environment, it tends to mature you very quick. So um, you tend to see that chefs in general around the globe, you meet them, they're very sharp. It's just the nature of the business. Mm -hmm. You have to be. Um, so it matured me very quick, quicker than I would have done if I had gone the traditional route of going to college and et cetera, et cetera. So um, professionally, I started at 15 and um, went from there, really. Oh. Yeah, didn't stop. So talking about your teenage years, mm. not only do you have a passion for food, but you also have a passion for music. Mm, absolutely. And something that I found very interesting was that this passion led you to become a DJ at illegal raves in the early 90s. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Very fun time. That was fun, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, do you see any similarities for how you mixed music back then and how you create food? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the process of DJing an illegal rave is you'd find a space break in illegally, <laughs> phone a number on a Friday night, and everybody would just show up. So restaurants aren't quite, well, maybe they are the same, but yeah. restaurants are a little more organized than that. Um, the, the, the mixing part of it, you know, to me it's about taking two things and creating something new and different from two things which are already existing. So whether we take a carrot and a parsnip and we make something out of it, or we take a rhythm of one track or another and we mix them into creating something else, the technique and the feel and the sensibility is the same. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about using your senses and your intuition with what's there in front of you and creating your own personal twist on it. So for me, yeah, there's a lot of similarity mm -hmm. in the, uh, the, that aspect of it, yes. Not the illegal aspect, just, <laughs> just the food part of it. Well, I bet you would mm -hmm. have an amazing underground food dining restaurant. There. Damn, it was fun though. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It was a fun time. Mm -hmm. And yes, I am old enough to remember that. Mm -hmm. Many of you here aren't, but it's, it was a pretty fun time. If you could go back to your early years, is there a restaurant or location that you would train at? Yes. Um, there was, a, there was a, a very, very famous chef in France called Alain Chapelle, mm -hmm. who passed away uh, far too early in his uh, early 50s in uh, Munay, in the uh, middle of France. Mm -hmm. And um, it was before my time. But that, that was one of those great, great chefs who really turned classical French cooking and put his creative spin on it in a way which nobody had really seen. I mean, Ducasse uh, trained with him. Um, and this was the gentleman that really redefined what today our generation um, and the generation, I guess, before us really do with food, the creative aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that is the one gentleman that I would have loved to, I would have loved to have eaten at his restaurant mm -hmm. while he was still there, but you know, I was, 
I was far too young to obviously do it, but yes, That's that would be the gentleman. That's amazing. Mm. So talking about the book for mm. a bit. So you say that this book isn't quite a memoir mm. and it's not a cookbook, mm -hmm. but you call it a literary tasting menu. That's correct. It's very cool. Can you tell us what that means? Um, well, you know, a literary tasting menu, it's, it's a, uh, it's the, as with a tasting menu, as with anything where there are multiple um, scenes or there are multiple um, choruses or rhythms or whatever to it, it tells a story. And that's the most important part of it. Yeah. Um, a tasting menu, um, when you have a great tasting menu, there should be a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there's ebb and flow to the whole thing, much the same way as when you go to see an opera or something similar. <laughs> So the book, we wanted to have the same feel to it. It's not a memoir because I'm simply not old enough to have that. It's a story. It's not a cookbook because I didn't want to do 100 recipes and pictures like a textbook. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something which tells a story and a narrative that is an, something that you can follow through like a tasting menu mm -hmm. and arrive at the end and make your own mind up on whether you enjoyed it or not. Well, I think it definitely... It, it definitely through. isn't one or the other. It's something which we try to do which would... And I wouldn't say break them all, but I would say do something different, not not do the same. It's definitely different. Mm. I, it's definitely reading the book. I hadn't I hadn't experienced something like that with. It's your story, but then you have these beautiful photos, and then there's recipes that are ingrained, but they're not. They don't overpower the book. Like I think mm. your story definitely shines, and the images are amazing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really beautiful book. There's great imagery between like the food that you create and then these great shots that are taken in the kitchen. Yeah, we, we had uh, Evan Sung, who's genius photographer, do the um, beautiful, beautiful photographs. And I said that like, he makes my job easy because he makes it look far better than I think it actually is. How long, have uh, you, how long did you work on the book from the um, process? About three years, start to finish, yes. yeah. That actually seems pretty quick for a book of that size. We work quickly. <laughs> yes, you do. Um, another point in your book, which I thought was interesting, is you reference food as the food. Mm. Can you describe what that difference is for you between food and the food? Um, I would say it harks back to maybe a more classic kind of approach where for me, what I do for a living, I still feel this and I will offer it's, it's, it's there's a reverence for what I do. The food. Mm -hmm. The vocational act of the profession that I've chosen is to nourish, is to feed people. It's very basic, it's a basic thing, but there's something which is very reverent about it. And for me, the food, I feel honored to be able to do this for a living. So when I say the food, I say it in a very respectful and very um, almost, uh, I would say, religious term of it's something which I do to, to, to please other people. It's not just a job. It's not food. It's something I hold to much higher. An art. You know? No, not an art. Not it's a craft. I was going to say craft, and then I art, thought the, art. Yes, there is artistic. Of course there is. The, the aesthetic is The is food on the plate is artwork. But it is a craft. As an artist, I can come in one day and cook a great meal and then not come back the next day and not have to do it because that's art. Mm -hmm. As a craftsman, which I view myself as a craftsman, albeit maybe an artistic craftsman, um, Every day I have to come in and deliver to the same level mm -hmm. because that's where the consistency and that's where the expectation for the guest comes in. Yeah. So for me, that's really what it's about. It's, it's, and it's, it's a long process and it takes decades and decades, mm -hmm. but it's that continual just chipping away. As somebody who's a sculpture, just everything they do is just they're chipping away to get the perfect form. Mm -hmm. Or a painter, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. So for me, the reverence, the rigor, all of that, mm -hmm. the food. The food. You do it very well. We try Amazing. hard. You succeed. So the book guides us through some of the most famed restaurant kitchens in the world. Are there any crazy stories that you excluded from the book that you can share with us now? <laughs> many, 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 yes. Can you share one of your favorites with us now? Um, but this is going on YouTube, so there'll be like children and stuff watching this, so <laughs> I shouldn't really say anything. Uh, <laughs> It might get me in trouble. Nothing gets you in trouble. Maybe one of your favorite stories from when you were younger. When I was younger. Gosh, those were the days. Um, so when I was working back in London, um, I think, you know, one, 
one that I do remember, and and you know the great British actors, um, they have a very there's a quirkiness about them. Whenever you if you ever meet any of the great British one, Richard Harris, who played Dumbledore in the first Harry two Harry Potter films, mm -hmm. was one of those guys. And I went to a restaurant called Lascago in London, still there, beautiful place, been there since 1927, oh. grand classical, but very small, almost like a big townhouse. So I was in the top restaurant, it's very small, and there were only three of us in the kitchen. And Richard Harris comes in one night, and this is obviously before uh, Harry Potter films, and came into the kitchen and proceeded to take his shirt off and ask everybody <laughs> if they could bum a cigarette off everybody. I didn't smoke, so I couldn't help him there, but took his shirt off. I think he was kind of drunk. Um, <laughs> and took his shirt off. It was summer. He said he was hot and, and went and said, can I have a cigarette? <laughs> In the middle of us cooking his dinner. And then walked out of the restaurant, down the street, asking everybody along the street, apparently, so I was told. And uh, the maitre d' had to chase after him and lead him back to the restaurant and That's amazing. take him upstairs. But, um, you know, he's, he's no longer with us. Yes. God bless him, so I can say that one. But, yeah, there are, there are a lot more. But, again, children might watch this, so I don't want to offend one. any parents. And, uh, and it's a great Harry Potter reference with that do for the kids. Yeah, I mean, Harry Potter, it's all true. Yes. It's all true. <laughs> you know, that was my childhood growing up in London. That's so great. Mm-hmm. Something else in the book that you talk about is your experience at a Star Wars marathon when you were a kid. Oh, yeah. And how you were drawn to Darth Vader. And I thought it was an interesting story to find in a chef's book. So many Googlers here, I'm sure you know, are Star Wars fans. So I have to ask, why does that moment stand out for you? That's because it was a Star Wars marathon. <laughs> Um, I was, well, this is what, 83 when Return of the Jedi came out, so I was seven years old, and it was my birthday, and my father, there was an old theatre called the Dominion Theatre, very famous theatre, mm -hmm. at the beginning of Tottenham Court Road, and they had the trilogy on, and they had all three films, and it was it, it, to be time with the release of um, Return of the Jedi, and my father said, right, we're going to go watch a movie, and I went, great, okay, so then we went for eight hours or whatever it was of just watching all three in a row, um, and uh, it was memorable. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. I wouldn't say I was drawn to Darth okay. Vader in particular. Just the whole vision of the whole thing, I think, is quite stunning. Yeah. Quite stunning. Are you still a fan of the Star Wars? I can't wait for next year when they, or next year, or 2016, or wherever it is, when they do the new one. Yeah. Oh, J.J. Abrams doing it. I'm very excited about I that. I actually didn't know that. Did anybody here know that J.J. Abrams was doing the... J.J. is Yeah, of course. Him. Who am I kidding? Business. Everybody's like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're in good company here. So what was your favorite discovery writing this book? The dis you know, it's kind of funny. It's like when we did the movie, um, we filmed the movie over 10 years, nine and a half years. So when you talk about your past and then you compile it over time, and then when you look back on it, you learn something about yourself. Um, so whether it be from a narrative point of view with the book, where I'm talking about things that I hadn't thought about in years, but for the purposes of this story that we were compiling here, we were talking about it and memories and, and, and things. And the same thing with the movie. When you look at yourself from a decade ago and you kind of cringe and go, ooh, really, um, you learn a lot. Um, some good, some bad, some things which inspire you for the future. Um, you know, my love of Chinese food, I guess I know where it comes from now. Yeah. Yeah. Growing up near Chinatown. Yeah, directly opposite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. What is one cookbook, besides your own, that people should have? Well, actually, yours is a literary tasting menu. But besides that book, what is a, what is a, a book about food or a cookbook that people should? Own? You know, I, I really, the, one of the first cookbooks I ever bought, and again, I wouldn't call it a necessary cookbook, but for me, what sold me on the profession of what I do now was White Heat by Marco Pierre White. Yes. Which... Again, um, the visual aspect of it, because you know, cooking by nature is a repetitive act. You come in every day, you do the same thing. And that's good, because that's the nature of the business. Mm -hmm. You get better by doing that. But a cookbook is the same thing. If it's 100 pages and 100 recipes and 100 pages and you flick through, it, it can look good and you can reference something, but generally you put it back, you put it back on the shelf, and it sits in a lovely collection. Mm -hmm. White heat at least for me, and I think for a few other people, was the first book where it wasn't like that. There was stunning food shots and stunning recipes, but Bob Carlos Clark's beautiful photography of 
really capturing what it's like to be in a professional kitchen. Mm -hmm. The sweat, the blood, the tears, the, uh, the tension, you see it in the photographs, was the first thing for me that really said, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I want to make my life in the kitchen. And most people would look at it and go, oof, because it, it, it's gruesome. Mm. I mean, it's grueling. It looks grueling. No, I, I was enveloped by it. So for me, I think that is the book that any young cook should look at. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very realistic view of what it's like to work in a professional kitchen. It is. It's, people say that it was one of, like, like you're saying, like the iconic. first. Yeah, yeah. It's iconic, yeah. He broke the mold. He did. Before that, it was the sort of typical portly French chef with the giant white hat yeah. standing there like this with a cockerel under his arm. Um, that's wonderful, but that's not real. Yeah. You know, the realisms are it's sweaty, it's hot, you're tired, you're undernourished, um, you have wet hands all the time, you cut yourself, people scream at you. That's the kitchen. It's, it, it is what it is. I mean, that's the nature of the business that we're in. Um, thank God it's gotten better. <laughs> than when I first started over 20 years ago. But, you know, I still think that it's important to understand the building blocks of why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. We're there to cook for people. Did you see, did you see a difference in kitchens and kitchen style, kitchen etiquette between London and Europe and, and New York? Very much so. I think um, Europe, um, you know, has more just simply because Europe has more of a uh, an older lineage when it comes to culinary history than this country does, just by the nature of its Europe. Yeah. I mean, um, you see that you know that French brigade system is still very much ingrained, and the whole reason for me coming to this country and to New York specifically was I wanted to get away from that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like growing up in the class system in England. You know, it's like your place in life, and you'll never get any higher because you're not born into mm -hmm. a certain kind of hierarchy. It's changed now because, you know, the world changes. But kitchens, um, the difference is it's very much like that in a kitchen. You work for the right people and then you go up the totem pole. Here, the refreshing thing is it, it really is, you know, you make it on your own work for the most part. Um, but it, it's, um, there's a big difference there with uh, Europe. I think it's changing more now. Yeah. In regards to see more young chefs doing their own personal style, which is great, um, and the world is obviously a, a much a much bigger place in terms of that. There's more options now, so yeah, kitchens have definitely changed a lot okay. for the better. Yeah. What about when you came to New York? Mm. What was one of the biggest surprises or biggest challenges that you <laughs> faced um, as a you know non-American in a very in a New York kitchen? Well, well, a my accent. Um, yes. And uh, vice versa, and I, I talk about this in the book. Um, um, vice versa, me understanding <laughs> the American terminology, especially working with people from California who would have this very sort of bro speak kind of way, which I had no <laughs> idea what they were saying. I remember there was a gentleman that I worked with at Boulay, and um, <laughs> he would he, he was working on this side of the stove. I was working on this side of the stove, and he would look at me and say. Hey guy, can I can I take my guy and write it in your guy? And I, I'm, I'm like, what? <laughs> that translated into, can I take this piece of lamb and braise it in the, the the shoe that you're making? I didn't know that because everyone else seemed to, but I didn't. True true story. Wow. Yeah. Um, but little things like that and my terminology. So that that was actually it sounds silly, but when you're in a kitchen, it's quick. Yeah. like this all the time and you've got to be very sharp and on the ball and you, it, a lot of it is sensibility like I say where you have a good team of guys and girls in the kitchen and there's that look it's that sensibility it's a it's a nod it's and you know if this course adjustments service is like going to war you plan but as soon as you go into it things change you have to adapt so I think that was actually for me a big one mm -hmm. and also people eat very quickly here yeah. As opposed to Europe, because in, in Europe, you know, you go to a, a fine restaurant, you're there for the night, right? You, mm -hmm. Three, four hours, normal, and that's par de cour. Here, it's, you know, hour and a half, bang. You want to yeah. go in a, and the volume aspect. Fine dining in Europe, you go to a beautiful restaurant, it's 30 covers, 30 people, 40 people, that's it. Here, it was like 100 plus people. I'm like, how do you do it? Organization, that's how you do it. So I, I think that was a big one big one for me. Yeah. That's really interesting about mm. the that the differentiation and then also I mean it is true I forget how fast mm. we eat. 
Very. Sometimes in New York, a little bit slower, maybe, but yeah, it is a, it's a definitely different experience, which translates to the kitchen in such a completely different way. In terms it, you of covers. have to work in a very different way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of talking more about present, mm. um, do you feel that dining in general is being repositioned? As far as? Mm, fine dining, more of casual dining. Do you think that, you know, is, is there still a place for fine dining? And of course. So how is it? Absolutely. How is it being redefined, though? You know, this is the thing. Um, you know, in, in, in any form, mm. there's a building block. So art there's a there's a building block of fine art, music, same thing, mm -hmm. wine making. Um, the folks at Petrus make Petrus wine the same way that they did a hundred years ago. Is it going to go out of fashion fifty years from now? Um, I don't think so. I think it's going to be harder for them with the climate, but I think it's not going to go out of fashion. Mm -hmm. The way I look upon it is like any great art form. Let's say like opera, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, a hundred years ago, people went to the opera. When they went to the opera, they wore a top hat, white gloves, tails, cane, because that's what you did when you went to the opera. You go to the same opera here that was playing a hundred years ago, people don't wear white gloves on the top hat, but they'll put on a suit and they'll, they'll enjoy it. But they still want the same feel, the sensibility. They want the same idea that they're gonna see something which is classic and beautiful. Um, fine dining is the same. I think there will always be room for well-prepared, good ingredients, um, and expertly crafted uh, product, mm -hmm. um, like a sports car, like anything. It, mm -hmm. th there's room for it, but how people approach it and how they want to experience it is different. Um, you th talk about fine dining. I think it's very interesting that you look at now that younger people experience fine dining at an earlier age now than they did, let's say, 40 years ago where if you went to a fine dining restaurant of like a Michelin three star, you would look at the dining room and it would be a certain age group. It would be an older clientele because that was what could afford it. And that was what was deemed as like, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it, the, the dynamics change. People, younger people have more money in their pocket than they do 50 years ago. Very they true. can afford it. and. Um, people want to experience of that. And so the way that you change your 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 rhythm of how you do a restaurant of the style that we do is you got to make it um, seem attractive to uh, a younger clientele, to a more worldly clientele, because mm -hmm. people travel around the world now solely for gastronomic experiences. Um, you go on holiday, you have eating experiences. So if you go to Hong Kong or Asia, a lot of, I mean, I do it too. I mean, you make a list of the restaurants you want to go to, yeah. as opposed to maybe 50 years ago, it was sites or a museum or, do you Very understand? Like, so, so, the, so, so, so the dynamic of how we produce what we produce, how we do it, the setting, the feel, the tone, the touch, all of it, we have to move with the times. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. That's normal. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of fine dining's dying. It's not a question of people don't want it. It's a question of how you approach it, mm -hmm. how you deliver it. Um, a nicely cooked piece of fish is still a nicely cooked piece of fish that people can enjoy. You know, I, I think that, you know, uh, it, it, it's, um, it's a question that a lot of people would probably disagree with me mm -hmm. with that, but that's the way I see it. Um, and it's a good thing, it's a, it's a relevant thing, you know, it's forward thinking. You see this more, do you see it it being redefined on a global scale, or do you think that it's going to be, you know, national? That what we could see in New York is going to be vastly different than what we would see in London. Oh no, no, it's a global. global. It's a global. If you travel around the world and you eat, you see that what people do in London mm -hmm. is uh, echoing of what we do here in New York, and vice versa. You go to Hong Kong, you see um, restaurants that are echoing what is happening in Spain or France, and and it's a global thing. It's not one particular um, part of the world or city. Um, what I think is very interesting is different cultures and different ways of eating um, and the sort of cross-pollination when it comes to uh, a style of cuisine blending with a French style of cuisine. For example, um, Ferran 
Adria with El Bui and the whole Spanish movement of um, very molecular, very technique driven, very almost pastry driven style of cooking, redefine the entire way that we organize our kitchens ourselves and how we approach food mm -hmm. and taking away the dogmatic view of a French style of eating. Um, now it's morphed into a Nordic kind of thing and the next one is going to be South America. And that brings a new world to us as chefs mm -hmm. and to customers because that makes ingredients, for example, in the Amazonian basin, which um, it will be, it is becoming and will be the next big global trend available to people globally, which people had no idea. Yeah. Um, I doubt most people, I mean, maybe you have, but have had fresh cashew nut pulp. It, I haven't. It Anybody is, here? it is like, un, is it? it's <laughs> unlike, you can't describe it. It doesn't taste anything like the nut, but it's one thing which is very, very specific to that part of the world. Mm -hmm. Things like this, which um, it's great. It's a good thing. It's how we learn. It's how, how food evolves. Yeah. And I think it's a really exciting time. Yeah. That's very, very true. I mm. want to try that for sure. Maybe we can get it here at Google. I'm sure nice. Google can source it. <laughs> I bet Google can Fanny source can. it. <laughs> um, so in this digital age, mm -hmm. how do you see technology changing the way you cook and how you approach food? Um, do you see it having any effects on how the kitchen is run, even currently? Absolutely. Um, technology is, has always gone hand in hand with cooking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whether it be the hard equipment that we use in the kitchen, mm -hmm. whether it be the precision <clears throat> elements like sous vide, for example, um, the apparatus to get good consistent results is now more affordable, it's easier to use. Um, and I think that that right there is technology working for the betterment of um, us as chefs, mm -hmm. and then we pass those results onto the consumer so they have a better experience um, in the hands of a skilled chef. I think. Um, what is very interesting is the sensory aspect of dining and technology and how that translates to the future or how it will translate to the future. Um, Andoni just uh, at Madrid Fusion um, uh, presented on this uh, app that you can smell. Wow. Like a scratch and sniff kind of thing on your, on no your phone. Way. Yeah, um, that you can plug it in and you can scratch and it will give you smells like when you're reading a book or... And, wow. and, and, I'm not saying that we're all going to do that, but I think it's an, at least it's an interesting idea yeah. that can morph into something else. I think if you look at, let's say, the espuma canister, a siphon, like a cream dispenser, mm -hmm. um, 20 years ago, Ferran was the first guy really to really utilize that, a whipped cream dispenser with a cartridge, which you put in, really? which was used for whipped cream and flavor it, and then start doing hot and cold and different things. But it's a whipped cream dispenser. Nowadays, any modern kitchen globally has one because it's just, it's the same as a pot or a pan. You, you have to have one because it's, it's become part of that necessary apparatus. Mm -hmm. So I think that that was technology right there and how it bled into. Sous vide is becoming, or has become, in every modern kitchen around the globe, the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important. Um, we use it, always have done. I think it's important, yeah. But ultimately, the best technology is what's in here. And what... And what's there and what's, here. Yes, so. exactly. So along, this, along the lines of technology, um, not so much technically speaking, but mm. this film, I want to bring up the film that you did, um, and the documentary that was made about you, and, and the current day and age, how everything is mm. so, you know, real time, and everyone wants to be on TV or film or have that kind of fame attribute, if you will, celebrity. Um, what would you tell them about your experience of being in an HBO documentary? Was it, did it have any effect on, you know, your life as a chef, on your career? Was there parts of it that you wish would not have been? First, let me, let me explain, <laughs> because we did this documentary, but a, when we started f filming, the director, Sally, started filming, it was never meant to be a documentary. Mm -hmm. It was simply, um, she's a documentary maker and she just wanted to film. It wasn't a grand scheme of compiling everything and making a movie. It was, mm -hmm. she just was interested in, she didn't really know. Mm -hmm. And it went on for years. 
10 years. I mean, like five years into it, I forgot that we were even doing something. I was just, <laughs> that's Sally. <laughs> She's filming. Yeah. <laughs> One day she'll do something with like 500 hours of footage she has. <laughs> and then she compiled it into a movie and HBO saw it as a pre, um, uh, pre-screening and, and bought it and sold it. But So we didn't start out... And there was no plan to say this, this is going to be on TV and we want to be famous or none of that, which is very different from food TV, so you speak. Um, and I don't strive for that personally. Um, so I think there's a, there's a balance there. It's a different. Again, we made a movie and it was really a story about a young person um, in a big city and it could be someone who's in any industry. Mm-hmm especially any creative industry, artist or musician or actor or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the trials and tribulations of just living life, and that was it. Um, and so it was, again, a narrative. Um, I thought they did a fantastic job on it. Um, and I think That's that, great. you know, it, it, I wouldn't say it changed my life at all. Um, you know, we get recognized a lot, which is, which is sometimes fun and sometimes not. Um, but I think more than that, I'm happy to just share my life and my story with other people out there in the world who I, as when we put the movie out, I find are very similar. You know, there's a lot of people out there globally. And we toured with the movie, Europe and uh, South America and Australia. And there's a lot of sim- symbiotic things with other people, other cultures, other professions that could say, hey, God, I, I thought it was just me. I, I'm in that position now. How did you, and, and, and looking at the film helped them kind of give them inspiration to maybe, I don't know, go, go through the door that they were not willing to go through. Mm-hmm. So for me, that was the f- that's the most important part of it. And a young chef that saw it and said, you've inspired me to want to you know, do this and really do it for a living. And I was having second thoughts. It's a hard business, that kind of thing. And if anything, I think that is the bigger sort of payoff yeah. um, for me personally. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's nice. Giving back, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So you have... You've- have done a movie, mm. you've written a book, mm. you've been working in restaurants since you were 14, 15. Yeah. You were a DJ. Yes. What could possibly be next? <laughs> what is next? Um, well, um, I'm, I'm training to be an amateur barber, actually. Next. Really? No, I'm a coach. I'm just joking. I wouldn't. I was like, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> I'm and you're going to spin the music in your barber shop. I know, whilst frying some eggs. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> You know, look. I mean, I uh, ultimately look. I'm I'm a chef. I'm a cook. Is the way I, I I view myself. I I get the thrill every day when I and and you know I have some of my my guys here and girls here and they'll tell you, I I get that thrill of walking in and standing next to them and the touch, the taste, the feel, and and cooking and then seeing the plate go out and looking at the customer and seeing their reaction and the emotion and that first taste and the smell and the smile and that kind of sit back and I think, and then it just, you see it. Mm-hmm. You see it when you feed someone and the joy you can bring. That is my goal, is to continue doing that because that's the business that I'm in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, if the barber thing takes off, I don't know, but <laughs> I, I think ultimately I'm, I'm, I'm a cook at heart. I'm just a cook. But, well, a very skilled and amazing, artistically crafted <laughs> cook at that. Um, so I've just got a couple more questions here and if anybody, um, we're going to open it up for Q&A in just a couple of minutes and there's mics in the audience if anybody has any questions. Um, so I like to wrap up these interviews with, you know, a finish this sentence style mm. of approach. So I've got a couple here for you. Please. Today is Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Mm-hmm. If you were to cook him a birthday dinner, what would it be? Well, it has to be something British, wouldn't it? Yes. Um, right. Maybe like a revolutionary hot pot or something like that. <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> a red coat hot pot. A red coat hot yeah. pot. Yeah. I think you should do it. Mm-hmm. The band or music that best represents your mu- your food is? Um, two. Nine Inch Nails, The Cure. Nice. Your favorite American food is? Lobster roll. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, yeah. A warm lobster roll. You like the warm? Oh, yeah. I like them both. Slightly toasted, a little bit of butter, soft bun, sweet, slightly briny lobster, fresh out of the ocean, a little bit of mayo. Oh, 
You're really making me want a lobster I'm roll right I'm now. I'm leaving. That's it. <laughs> we'll go over to the go Chelsea some, Market. I'm going to go to the lobster place in Chelsea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Market, right? yeah. um, your favorite DJ is? Carl Cox, DJ Hype, two of them. Yes. That, so that's good. like a very old school British DJs. So good. Very good. Yeah. Your favorite type of cuisine to eat? Japanese food. Okay. Your, what is your favorite restaurant that people should know about? That people should know about. That you're willing to let people in on. Mm. <laughs> um, and anywhere globally or just? Sure. Globally. Globally. It's going to be on YouTube. Okay. Let's let people know. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Um, well, I think, look, personally, because it has such a big impact with me, mm -hmm. Pierre Gagnier in Paris. Gagnier. Pierre, thank you. Um, Pierre Gagnier, because uh, that man redefined the way I think about what I do. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I would say for me, that's closest to my heart. Magic, real magic. Yep. Is there a specific dish that people should get there? No, it changes all the time. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm adding that to my list of places Please. to eat when I go. Please. Um, and the last question is, you've just, let's say you've just finished a grueling day, mm. you're tired, you're exhausted, mm -hmm. what do you eat at the end of a shift? And what do you drink, more importantly? Uh, drink water. Water? Water. Um, and I would say to eat, um, I, I like sushi. Yeah. yeah, sashimi and sushi at one o'clock in the morning is the perfect time. I'm gonna- It well, really is, yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. If anybody has any questions, we're going to open it. I think you're up. Yeah, hi. First, I wanted to uh, say thank you. Um, the Elm was somewhere in my top four favorite meals of last year. It's really difficult to actually, you know, order those, but it was absolutely wonderful, and I hope to come back soon. Thank you very much. Um, and normally, every chef that comes here, I ask them whether or not they consider themselves a craftsman or an artist, but you already took that. Okay. So my backup question is, uh, what is your favorite ingredient that you don't get to use often? Either whether it's because the general public dislikes it, it's scarce, it's too expensive. Hmm. Um, personally speaking, I think uh, shellfish and fish, for me, are my favorite ingredients to work with. And of that, I would say um, there is a, there's a lobster, a, a, a species of lobster called a cigale de mer, which is um, not a vi very widely used lobster, which you get from the Mediterranean. Um, and it's uh, known as a slipper lobster. It's very expensive, very seasonal. Um, I only ever used it in France at Pierre Gagnier, and it, it's a very rare item. But the flavor is like eating vanilla. It's stunning. Um, so that would be one of them, yes. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for coming in. My it was pleasure. such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And I want to... Um, Chef has agreed to sign some books at the end, so you guys are welcome to come up and we'll conclude the speech. Thank you very much.